Hello. In this video, I'm going to talk about what archaeologists call pseudo-archaeology. This involves kinds of theories that are quite sensational, but are not based on the kinds of evidence that archaeologists consider acceptable. There are many kinds of pseudo-archaeology, and today I'm only going to focus on three of the main types of pseudo-archaeology, and we don't have time in a video like this to debunk all of the claims of any one of these theories, let alone all of them. But what I'll try to do in today's video is to focus on the kinds of arguments that the authors of pseudo-archaeological theories use in order to convince their audiences, and kind of analyze those arguments to figure out what lies beneath them, and to see whether or not there really is any evidence there, or if they're just distorting the evidence or making it up. For many centuries, People have wondered and speculated about ancient monuments they found in their landscapes. How did they get there? Who erected them and how? How did they place them so precisely? And how is it that they appear to have been so knowledgeable about things like astronomical phenomena? These and other puzzles often inspired people to ascribe such monuments to supernatural or otherworldly beings. For example, Geoffrey of Monmouth drawing on 11th and 12th century folklore, attributed the construction of Stonehenge to giants working under the supervision of Merlin the Magician. Not surprisingly, many of the conspiracy theories associated with pseudo-archaeology focus on ancient Egypt and especially the Giza pyramids. These monuments have excited speculation since ancient times, but they've been a particularly fertile field for such theorizing during the past century or so. The millions of tourists who visited Giza during the 20th century were sure to be amazed by the size of the blocks used to build these pyramids. And the supposed mysteries of ancient Egypt were quick to enter popular culture. From the mummy to Stargate, all these fictional stories about Egypt are great fun. The problem is, some people take some of these fictions seriously. By the mid-20th century, Giza was firmly entrenched as the centerpiece of pseudo-archaeology. With many fringe theorists attempting to date both the pyramids and the Sphinx many millennia earlier than the conventional date in the Old Kingdom. Ascribing them an age of about 10,000 years, facilitates comparisons to one of the latest members of the Club of Pseudo-Archaeology Stars, the early Neolithic site of Gobekli Tepe in Turkey. There's no question that discoveries at this site over the past 25 years have been extremely important and have altered our ideas about life at the beginning of the Holocene among both archaeologists and the general public. However, some authors have seized on this site as well as the Giza pyramids to argue for the presence of some pre-Holocene advanced civilization that was supposedly responsible for these kinds of monuments. I'll return to that topic later on in this video. But first, I turn to the claim that there are mysterious messages encoded in the pyramids. Pyramidology has its origin in an 1859 book by John Taylor but most of its details come from an 1864 book by Charles Piazzi Smith. Smith argued that if you measured the various features of the pyramids using a unit called the pyramid inch, or 1 25th of a so-called sacred cubit, you would find that the Great Pyramid encoded a divine message that included prophecies about what was then the future. A number of other authors built on these theories which reached their height of popularity in the 1980s. Despite abundant evidence that some of these theorists actually falsified measurements in order to make them fit their theories. But pyramidology has resurrected itself in a somewhat different form. Now, some authors want you to believe that there are codes in the pyramids that are messages from some advanced civilization, whether terrestrial or extraterrestrial. In this and other books, Creighton and Osborne claim that the pyramids are not tombs, but rather vaults of information for resetting civilization after a planetary disaster. They claim that the angles and geometry of the Great Pyramid record a shift in the Earth's axis in 3980 BC. However, this is a very misleading claim. 
This angle, called the angle of obliquity, changes continuously over time, on a 41,000 year cycle. There is no good reason to highlight 3980 BC among these 41,000 years. In other places, Osborne and others try to argue that the latitude of the Great Pyramid encodes information about the speed of light. They claim that the Great Pyramid's latitude is 29.9792458 degrees north. And note that this appears to match the speed of light in a vacuum. 299,792,458 meters per second. However, this only works if we measure the speed of light in meters per second. The meter, as a standard unit, wasn't even invented until the 1700s and didn't become widely used until the 19th century. So one could well ask why Egyptians, extraterrestrials, or anyone else would record secret messages in a unit that wasn't even invented yet. If we measure the speed of light using other units, such as cubits per second or inches per second, we get a result that bears no resemblance to Giza's latitude. We could also ask why anyone would measure latitude in decimal degrees instead of degrees, minutes, and seconds, and at the same time measure the speed of light in some unit per second, rather than in decimal days or decimal hours. And then there's an even more serious problem. In point of fact, the latitude cited here does not pass through the apex of the Great Pyramid. It misses it by about 11 meters. So much for the precision of the pyramid's builders, whom we're expected to believe could measure the speed of light to seven decimal places. What this all boils down to is that we can manipulate numbers to get any results we want, as long as we can make up the rules as we go along. Let's use Toronto's CN Tower as an example. This communications tower, and Toronto's most prominent landmark, is 553.3 meters high. However, we can also express that height in inches and compare it with Toronto's longitude, 79 degrees, 23 minutes, 11.9895 seconds west. If we multiply the three components of that longitude together, what we get is... exactly the height of the tower in inches. Of course, this only works because I was able to make up the rules as I went along. By making judicious selection of units and playing around with any mathematical rules you want to devise, you can always get the result that you want. And don't even ask why extraterrestrials or anyone else would want to encode such information in a monument in the first place. But before we leave this topic, let's turn to one more example that has to do with the distance between the Giza pyramids and the Neolithic site of Gobekli Tepe. As I mentioned earlier, some authors like to date the Giza pyramids much earlier than the 3rd millennium BC in order to make these sites contemporary with one another. According to Gary Osborne, the distance from the apex of the Great Pyramid to Gobekli Tepe is exactly 1,080 kilometers. By my reckoning, it's slightly less than that, but let's give him the benefit of the doubt. According to Osborne, these two sites were placed at this precise distance apart in order to encode the information that this was 1 24th of a precessional cycle. The length of time it takes for one wobble of the Earth's axis relative to the stars. This actually overestimates the length of a precessional cycle by about 150 years. And even if these two sites were contemporary, they're not. And if ancient people were able to measure the distance between them, they weren't. And if they measure distances in kilometers, they didn't. One could still ask why they would be interested in recording something as esoteric as a processional cycle instead of some more useful astronomical event, like stellar events that would help them predict the seasons. Lest I leave you with the impression that Gary Osborne is the only author who talks like this, I'll briefly cite another example from Graham Hancock's Magicians of the Gods. Once again, with reference to the processional cycle, he says, It so happens that 54 is one of the sequence of processional numbers. It derives from 72, the number of years required for one degree of processional motion. We then add 36, half of 72, to get 108, and divide 108 by 2 to get 54. If that's not a roundabout way to derive a number from the processional cycle, I don't know what is. 
Hancock goes on to note that the original number of columns of the Temple of Jupiter at Baalbek was 54. As though that has some mysterious significance. One could just as easily have picked a Roman temple with 30 columns, or 32, or only 12. This is just another example of cherry-picking the evidence to get the number you want. And apparently Hancock found it difficult to find a Roman temple with 72 columns. <laughs> you think that looks like an extraterrestrial? Do you think we have nothing better to do than to build pyramids? Today, a very popular form of pseudo-archaeology involves attributing the works of ancient cultures to extraterrestrials. Although it has an older history, today's ancient aliens craze owes a lot to the publications of Eric von Daniken from the 1960s onward. In a series of best-selling books beginning with Chariots of the Gods, von Daniken used circumstantial evidence and innuendo to argue that many ancient monuments were in fact built by extraterrestrials. An author whose career overlapped with that of von Daniken was Zechariah Sitchin. He claimed that the Sumerian gods were extraterrestrials from a planet called Nibiru, which allegedly lies outside the orbit of Neptune. Conveniently, Sitchin claims to be the only person who can read Sumerian texts accurately, despite the fact that he had no formal training in ancient languages. He claimed that these Anunnakin visited the earth every 3,600 years and were responsible for many aspects of human culture. He even goes as far as to claim that they engineered humans from Homo erectus. Both von Daniken and Sitchin had considerable impact on popular culture, providing inspiration for such movies as Stargate. Some of the alleged evidence for ancient aliens comes from facile similarities between artifacts or images in ancient art and pieces of modern technology. For example, some people will look at this Assyrian image of a winged being and ask themselves, isn't he wearing a wristwatch? Of course, the more obvious interpretation is that it's just a bracelet. In addition, since our modern division of the day into two sets of 12 hours each originated in ancient Mesopotamia, one could well ask why any Assyrian artist would depict any kind of clock with 13 divisions. One could also ask why aliens with an advanced technological culture would be using a timepiece that's unique to the 20th century. Another example is this gold pectoral depicting the Aztec god of death, Mictlantecutli. Focusing on the decoration on the lower part of the pectoral, Eric von Daniken says, in fact, it is quite easy to deduce a modern electronic integrated circuit from the chest decoration. Well, actually, it's not. Anyone with the slightest knowledge of electronics would tell you that it would be ridiculous to think of this as an electronic circuit. And equally ridiculous to think that advanced aliens would be using 20th century electronics. Another of von Daniken's facile analogies involves the Nazca lines of southern Peru. These geoglyphs can be several hundred meters wide and run for thousands of meters in a straight line. Eric von Daniken would have you believe that these are landing strips similar to modern runways, as well as landing bays for spacecraft. What he doesn't bother to mention is that many of these straight lines dead end at mountains and that they're formed by removing the top layer of pebbles to a depth of about 10 centimeters, revealing the lighter colored pebbles underneath. Consequently, they are not prepared roads and would not be suitable to land any kind of craft on them. There are also other geoglyphs at Nazca with figurative designs. And taken as a whole, a much more plausible explanation for the Nazca geoglyphs is that they have something to do with cosmology and perhaps ritual processions. Some authors have also associated them with constellations and astronomical alignments. In a number of instances, von Daniken identifies what he suggests are spacesuits in ancient figurines and art. In the case of Jamon figurines from northern Japan, for example, he sees these figures as wearing spacesuits with helmets that have goggle-like faceplates. 
Von Däniken simply ignores the more plausible explanation that these figurines are wearing snow boots, parkas, and snow goggles, similar to ones that people in the Arctic have used for the last few centuries. Von Däniken offers a similar interpretation of Toltec statues. Rather than see these as warriors in battle gear, he asks, what sort of boxes have they on their chests? Didn't the moon astronauts carry very similar apparatuses on their chests? What else can be held in two fingers, if not ray guns, laser appliances, which melted the rocks? As you'd expect, von Daniken ignores the archaeologist's interpretation that the butterfly-shaped thing on the warrior's chest is a breastplate, and the thing in his fingers is not a ray gun, but an atlatl, or spear thrower. But wait a minute. When we look down, aren't those bare knees? Surely we'd expect an astronaut who needed an oxygen pack on his chest to remember to wear pants. In a similar vein, von Daniken interprets warrior figures on the Madrid Codex as ancient astronauts. He claims they depict the whole arsenal of spaceflight paraphernalia, supply systems, helmets with transmitters, an observer in a satellite, and oxygen apparatus. He ignores the fact that they're carrying spears and battle axes, and the more plausible explanation that the thing on their backs is just a backpack. And yes, this time the spacesuits not only omit pants, these guys even have bare feet. In addition, he takes these figures out of context. In fact, the Madrid Codex shows all kinds of people doing various kinds of things, none of them having anything to do with spaceflight. Some ancient aliens enthusiasts like to identify things in ancient art that they think represent aircraft or spacecraft. A popular example of this so-called evidence is this frieze from the Temple of Seti I at Abydos. According to ancient aliens enthusiasts, it depicts a helicopter. And some may point to this part of the frieze as showing some kind of advanced aircraft or spacecraft. However, what's really going on here is that this inscription was recarved several times with parts of the previous inscriptions being covered over with plaster, kind of like ancient whiteout. There were three distinct sets of inscriptions. But after the plaster fell out over the years, we were left with a palimpsest of the three. At no time in antiquity did that upper left portion ever look like a helicopter. Sometimes a duck is just a duck. Another very popular branch of pseudo-archaeology, rather than focusing on extraterrestrials, is based on the argument that there was an advanced and very ancient civilization that was responsible for these monuments. And that archaeologists have either failed to document or have covered up as part of some grand conspiracy. Many proponents of this theory claim that the civilization was wiped out by a cometary impact around 13,000 years ago and was the source of the legend of Atlantis. The story of Atlantis comes from two of Plato's Socratic dialogues, Timaeus and Critias, especially the latter. In conjunction with Plato's other dialogues, it's very clear that the Atlantis story was meant to be a sort of parable, with an idealized Athens and a fictitious Atlantis standing in for two different forms of government and culture. It's unlikely that any of Plato's contemporaries in the 4th century BC would have treated it as any kind of historical account, any more than they would have considered Aristophanes' cloud cuckoo land to be an actual city built by birds. Yet that's exactly what people in recent centuries have done. An influential proponent of the view that the Atlantis story should be taken literally was Ignatius Donnelly, who published a book on it in 1882. According to Donnelly, the Azores Islands were just the tips of mountains that were the only visible remnant of the continent of Atlantis, which he reconstructed as being west of the Straits of Gibraltar. Today, we know enough about the Atlantic seafloor to know that there is no such sunken continent there. But modern proponents of the Atlantis theory have simply moved on to other places, such as the Caribbean, or Southeast Asia, or Antarctica, or even, believe it or not, the Sahara Desert as the location of Atlantis. Wherever this advanced civilization supposedly was, after some major cataclysm, 
cometary impact perhaps. Some survivors allegedly spread to various parts of the world and taught the primitive hunter-gatherers there some of their knowledge. This is supposed to account for the fact that pyramids and pyramid-like structures occur in various parts of the world, albeit in different eras, all many millennia after 13,000 years ago. And it's also supposed to account for the highly precocious architecture at sites like Gobekli Tepe, which both Andrew Collins and Graham Hancock associate with this fictitious ancient civilization. None of these authors seem prepared to accept that these hunter-gatherers were in fact a lot more sophisticated than they give them credit for. Much of pseudo-archaeology is premised on the assumption that ancient people were technologically unsophisticated and not particularly intelligent. In fact, some of these theories seem to conceive of prehistoric people as mindless brutes. So when adherents of these theories see an archaeological site like Stonehenge, they can't possibly conceive of how ancient people would have had the astronomical knowledge in order to create the alignments. Part of the problem lies in the fact that modern people mostly live in cities and never really see the night sky because of all the light pollution. By contrast, pre-industrial people would have been keenly aware of the night sky. They would have given names to the major stars and over hundreds of generations, they would have accumulated knowledge about how the stars appeared to move across the sky with the seasons. And they would also have noticed the major planets because they appeared to move in an erratic manner relative to the stars. I'm not suggesting that they knew the Earth was a sphere, or that it had orbited the Sun, or that they could make precise measurements on celestial bodies, let alone measure things like processional cycles or angles of obliquity. What I am seeing is that they would have made observations on seasonal and other changes that you can make with the naked eye. In higher latitudes, one of the things they would certainly have noticed was that the sun was higher in the sky during summer than it was in winter. And if they stood at the same spot every morning and evening, the position of sunrise and sunset relative to the horizon would change over the course of the seasons. Before long, they would notice that this was true not only of our sun, but of other stars as well. But you might ask, how did they translate this knowledge into the precise alignments in monuments like Stonehenge? In fact, they did it by simple common sense. To make straight lines and to align them with celestial events, all you really need is some very simple tools and then one or two buddies. Let's say we want to erect a row of standing stones on along a perfectly straight line. It doesn't require any high technology to do that. We can do it as simply as using two wooden stakes, a length of string or rope, and a hammer or a hammer stone. I'll demonstrate. As long as the string is taut, we have a perfectly straight line. It's as simple as that. Of course, making a straight line isn't the whole story. Quite often we'd want that line to align with something of significance, such as the setting of the sun, or the setting of the star Sirius, or perhaps a mountain on the horizon. To do that, we need one more piece of simple technology, the plumb bob, which can be something as simple as a heavy stone notched on two sides with a string tied onto it and when we dangle that thing it always makes a perfectly vertical line which we can then use by eye to line up the stake on the ground with some feature on the horizon such as the setting of the sun. People would have realized how to make plumb bobs almost as soon as they started to make string or twine because the drop spindle used to make twine also makes a perfect vertical line. To align our row of stones, we probably start with wooden stakes. Let's say we want to align our stones with the midsummer sunrise. 
Having placed a stake where we want to begin our line, we hold our plumb bob above the stake and align it with the sunrise. We then direct another person who has a stake and a hammer to move a little to the left, a little to the right, until the stake is on the line. That person then drives in the stake and we tie a taut string between the two stakes. You might ask, how do we know which morning we should do this? Actually, you'd only need to know approximately when Midsummer's Day was, and then you repeat this process for, let's say, a week. Then, whichever stake is farthest to the east or north is the one that aligns with this Midsummer Sunrise, which on our calendar occurs close to June 21st. We can follow exactly the same procedure to find the sunrise or sunset at the equinox or winter solstice, as well as to make alignments with the risings or settings of important stars. So the alignments aren't all that mysterious, but what about the geometrical precision in some of these monuments? Well, the geometry really isn't all that difficult either. For example, to make a circle, all we need to do is drive a stake into the ground, tie a length of rope to the stake with a pointy stick attached to the other end, and use the stick to scribe the circle. If we want to place six stones precisely at equal distances around a circle, all we need is a rope that's divided in a half, and several stakes. Our halved rope allows us to make a series of equilateral triangles that eventually describe a hexagon. If instead of six stones we want to place 12 stones, we can follow much the same procedure after first bisecting the distance between two of our initial stakes. We can even make a horseshoe shape by finding the distance between this stake and that one and using it to draw a triangle in this direction. We then use the same ropes to do the same thing on the other side, and the resulting stakes allow us to draw two parallel lines that we can then use to align our stones. Methods along these lines could have been used to align the horseshoe of sarsen trilithons at Stonehenge. The resulting set of stakes or stones allows us to scribe lots of other geometrical shapes, including right angle triangles and equilateral triangles. And there are other geometrical games we can play as well. Some people are also amazed at how precisely the ancient Egyptians were able to align the Giza pyramids with true north. But that's not so difficult either, at least when the horizon is reasonably level. Using our stakes and plumb bob method, we find the alignment to the rising of the sun or some other star, and also the setting of that star on the same day. Ensuring that our stakes are of equal distance from the starting stake. Then we use the same two ropes to plant a fourth stake. A line between the first and last stakes will be a nearly perfect north-south line, while one between the second and third stakes will be an east-west line. Of course, knowing how to align these monuments is a far cry from actually being able to build them. And not surprisingly, many 20th and 21st century people simply cannot imagine how it would have been possible without modern mechanized machinery like cranes. We're so dependent on modern technology that we find it almost impossible to imagine any other options. Ironically, perhaps, previous generations were less phased by these problems. For example, while the ancient Greek historian Herodotus thought that the pyramids were an amazing piece of engineering, he still didn't find them beyond the capability of either Egyptians or Greeks. According to his informants, the making of the pyramid took 20 years, and when they had first made the base, they raised the remaining stones with machines made of short pieces of timber, raising them first from the ground to the first stage of the steps, and when the stone got up to this, it was placed upon another machine standing on the first stage, and so from this it was drawn to the second upon another machine, for as many as were the courses of the steps to each stage successively. Now Herodotus doesn't describe what this timber-built machine looked like, but it's tempting to wonder whether they might have been similar to the machines that the retired construction worker Wally Wallington in Michigan used to construct imitations of Stonehenge that he built with his own two hands. Wallington was able to erect full-size concrete replicas of Stonehenge trilithons all by himself 
using nothing more than levers, counterweights, and wooden wedges. I'll place some links below this video to some of the sites that show Wallington at work so you'll know what I mean. People in later centuries also demonstrated the ability to move extremely large stones without the benefit of modern technology. For example, the Romans appropriated a number of Egyptian obelisks and re-erected them in Rome and elsewhere. Here, for example, we see a relief showing the re-erection of the obelisk of Karnak in Constantinople in AD 390. The only technology the Romans had that probably wasn't available to the ancient Egyptians consisted of these capstans. This practice of re-erecting obelisks returned in the Renaissance. Here we see the erection of the obelisk in front of St. Peter's Basilica at the Vatican in 1586. And here we see the erection of the so-called Cleopatra's Needle in New York City in 1881. The only technology used here that wouldn't have been available to New Kingdom Egyptians was block and tackle. Finally, it's worth noting that ancient people often showed us exactly how they moved these large stones. This Egyptian tomb relief, for example, shows dozens of people moving a colossal statue on a sledge, while one man pours a lubricant in front of the sledge, perhaps oil or water. The Egyptians also left us scenes showing obelisks being transported by boat on the Nile River while the Assyrians also left scenes showing the movement of large statuary on sledges. There's certainly no reference here to UFOs or anti-gravity devices. And the Romans left us such detailed images of their cranes that today we can make working replicas. The massive moai of Easter Island have also attracted a lot of speculation about how these massive statues were carved, moved, and erected. Best known for his Contiki expedition, Tor Heyerdahl investigated these questions in the mid-20th century and hired some local people to carve an unfinished statue as well as to move one statue and to erect another. When Heyerdahl asked the local mayor how his ancestors moved the statues from the quarry to their final resting place, he received the unsatisfying answer that they walked. Unwilling to accept this answer, Heyerdahl convinced the mayor to get 180 of the Easter Islanders to drag a 12-ton statue across the plain on a sledge. However, in the 1980s, it emerged that the claim that the statues walked should be taken more seriously. Experiments by Pavel Pavel, Tor Heyerdahl, and Charles Love showed that small teams of about 20 people could actually walk a statue by means of ropes tied around the forehead. This method proved rather dangerous, but allowed them to estimate that you could move a 20-ton statue about 100 meters per day. Once again, indigenous practical knowledge proved superior to modern technology. Both von Daniken and many of the conspiracy theorists who followed him used the example of the Temple of Jupiter at Baalbek as evidence that it could not have been built with ancient technology. In particular, they point to the massive trilithons that make up part of the podium for the temple. Each of these weighs hundreds of tons, and there's no question that moving them from the quarry to the site would have been a massive undertaking. As von Daniken put it, even giving full rein to our imaginations, we cannot conceive that these stones were transported by the methods usually postulated by archaeologists. Conveniently, Neither von Daniken nor most of the people who have followed in his footsteps bother to say what these theories postulated by archaeologists might be. Nor do they show any indication that they know anything at all about ancient Roman technology. In fact, quite a bit is known about it. And in the case of Baalbek, a French scholar named Jean-Pierre Adam demonstrated way back in 1977 how the massive stones could have been moved from the quarries on rollers and maneuvered into place with capstans, ropes, and pulleys. In fact, even today, the stones show round and square holes where the Romans would have put wooden pegs for attaching the ropes. Can we conclude definitively that the stones were moved exactly as Adam suggests? Clearly not. But it's also clear that it's patently false to say that the Romans had no technology at all capable of moving such blocks. A piece of technology that has attracted a great deal of interest 
among those who want to argue for ancient aliens or pre-Neolithic civilizations is the Antikythera device. This clockwork mechanism, originally housed inside a wooden case, would have been a sort of analog computer able to predict eclipses and other astronomical events. It was found in 1901 in a Greek shipwreck and probably dates somewhere between 200 BC and 60 BC. However, although this is a particularly sophisticated example, it is not beyond the capability of ancient Greeks. Even before discovery of this mechanism, it was well known that the ancient Greeks were well versed in how to make clockworks and even automata. And Hero of Alexandria even wrote a book on automata in the first century AD. The Greeks' knowledge about clockworks and automata passed on to the Islamic civilization. Returning to astronomical calculators like the Antikythera device, the Roman orator Cicero, around the middle of the first century BC, said that he had seen a very similar device built by Archimedes of Syracuse almost two centuries earlier, as well as another one built by his own teacher, Posidonius. There is no reason to attribute the Antikythera device to anyone other than the ancient Greeks. One of the interesting things about pseudo-archaeology are that its claims are often in the form of rhetorical questions or arguments from silence. For example, rather than state something, they ask, could it be such and such? Or sometimes, rather than making a well-reasoned argument, they just say, it seems obvious to me. Or perhaps, how else could it happen? Conveniently leaving out any alternative explanations. Or sometimes they just cite evidence in misleading or incomplete ways. For example, when Eric von Daniken wants to present the Israelites' Ark of the Covenant as an extraterrestrial artifact, he says when Uzzah touched the Ark, he died as if struck by lightning Undoubtedly, the Ark was electrically charged. As if that settles the matter. However, Von Daniken doesn't bother to mention that neither 2 Samuel nor 1 Chronicles says anything about lightning or electricity. They just say that it was a drop dead. Nor does he bother to mention that the prohibition against touching the Ark also apply to the other equipment of the tabernacle, such as the table and candelabra and dishes. This rather selective and misleading presentation of the evidence is telling. In another example, von Daniken shows us the lid of a sarcophagus from the Mayan city of Palenque. He asks us, did the extraterrestrial spacemen give the Maya artists a simplified schematic drawing of a spaceship? Well, no, that really just doesn't make any sense. Not only does it require a real stretch of the imagination in order to conceive of this scene as representing an astronaut in some kind of space capsule, it's also ridiculous to think that an advanced extraterrestrial civilization would suggest that a spaceship should look like a 1960s Mercury space capsule in the first place. Yet to Van Daniken, it is self-evident that the Maya supplied news about their celestial messenger and inscribed his history in a way familiar to the Maya. To say that this is self-evident is not an argument. It's simply an insult to the intelligence of his readers. In another place, where von Däniken draws attention to a tree symbol that's found on many ancient Mesopotamian cylinder seals, he asks the rhetorical question, are they not embarrassingly like the double helix, referring to strands of DNA? Well, this one is very easy to answer, because they actually bear no resemblance whatsoever to DNA. Rather, they look like trees. Of course, the use of these rhetorical devices is not limited to von Daniken. For example, in his book, Magicians of the Gods, Graham Hancock asks, with reference to the Watchers mentioned in the books of Enoch and Daniel, were the Watchers the emissaries of a lost civilization of the Ice Age? Perhaps a civilization as far ahead of the Upper Paleolithic hunter-gatherers as our own civilization is ahead of the uncontacted tribes in the Amazon rainforests? 
Here he's referring to the civilization that he claims thrived before a comet impact wiped it out and triggered the Younger Dryas climate event around 13,000 years ago. He goes on to say, I see no reason in principle why they should not have existed in the remote epoch before the great cataclysms of the Younger Dryas set in between 10,800 BC and 9,600 BC. Well, I guess you'd see no reason as long as you ignored all the evidence that archaeologists have accumulated for what was going on in the Pleistocene Ice Age and the period directly before the Younger Dryas. We actually know quite a lot about this period. The people then were no fools, but far from living in futuristic cities, they lived in caves and in brush huts. They had sophisticated stone tools, as well as tools made from bone and shell. And some of them also had well-made groundstone tools, domesticated dogs, and the beginnings of herd management. What we don't find is any trace of futuristic technology, not so much as a chunk of concrete or a piece of metal. So we're forced to conclude that something would have had to have obliterated all trace of it. Even though the much more ephemeral hunter-gatherers have left us plenty of evidence in the form of stone tools, bones, and very fragile plant remains. With no real evidence, Hancock asks, was it then that the last survivors of the once advanced and prosperous civilization set out to wander the world in ships to initiate their great design, to bring about the resurrection of the former world of the gods? Notice here, as in cases I previously mentioned, that Hancock puts his claim in the form of a question. Given the lack of any real evidence, I would have to answer, no. And let's not forget that modern pseudo-archaeology depends not only on rhetoric, but also on images. But you need to be skeptical of such images. The image you see here that evokes a flooded Atlantean temple is one that I myself concocted using Photoshop. It took me no more than five minutes. Although it's not always overt, many of these theories have an underlying theme of racism. Namely, they operate on the premise that the indigenous people responsible for ancient monuments, many of whom were non-European, could not possibly have executed these monuments themselves. As already noted, there's a tendency to view these people as mindless brutes. And we only need to look at the kind of language that some of these authors use to describe prehistoric people. Returning to the example of the Jamon figurines, von Daniken says, I say to myself that if a cave dweller, even though clad in skins, portrayed figures in unfamiliar suits with helmets on their heads, he must have seen such beings. Here von Daniken betrays his assumption that prehistoric people were the cartoonish oafs that we see in popular culture, clad only in the most minimal animal skins. In reality, the Jamon were not cave dwellers, and like many prehistoric people, would have had sophisticated clothing. In their case, perhaps somewhat similar to the clothing of relatively recent Innu people in the Arctic. We know this because, even though we don't actually find prehistoric clothing, we do find the tools used to sew that clothing, as well as shells and buttons that were sewn onto the clothing. Many of the theories involving advanced pre-Neolithic civilizations have definite racist overtones. Even though Ignatius Donnelly probably did not think of himself as a racist, he nonetheless thought that the Atlanteans were Aryans, thus sharing with later Nazis the view that advanced civilizations were associated with the Aryan race. In fact, many 19th century scholars, as well as 20th century amateurs who were fascinated by accounts of ancient transatlantic voyages, have simply been unwilling to accept that very impressive sites in North America, like Cahokia and Moundville, could have been built by indigenous people. Why should they have found this so difficult to believe? While the racism in most of the recent conspiracy theories is pretty implicit, one author's work is very explicitly racist. Robert Sapere appropriates Donnelly's and others' views about Atlantis 
and explicitly claims that all the ancient civilizations were ruled by white-skinned Aryans. I don't plan to say anything more about this Adolf Hitler apologist. Some proponents of pseudo-archaeology claim that archaeologists are well aware of extraterrestrials or pre-Neolithic civilizations, but are involved in some grand conspiracy to hide the truth. Many books, websites, and YouTube videos are based on this premise. But how can this make any sense at all? The reality is that archaeologists' careers, especially among academic archaeologists, depend not on hiding evidence, but publishing it. No archaeologist gets ahead in the world of jobs, promotion, and tenure by hiding evidence. Instead, they not only have to conduct research and publish it, their careers depend on publishing papers in journals that are highly likely to be cited, generating the citation statistics that are likely to benefit them later on. It just so happens that surprising or exciting results are far more likely to be cited than more mundane ones. By contrast, there is no benefit whatsoever to burying the evidence. In fact, even when it's controversial, it's always better to bring it out into the open. And if a new theory is well supported by evidence, it eventually finds acceptance. A good example of this is the controversy over when the first people made it into the New World from Asia. About 50 years ago, the orthodoxy among archaeologists was that these people crossed into North America only around 12 or 13,000 years ago by means of the Bering Land Bridge which resulted from the lower sea levels during the Ice Age. This was an era when sea levels were low and people could have walked across Beringia through an ice-free corridor, perhaps in pursuit of game. At the time, most archaeologists thought that the earliest sites in North America belonged to what is known as the Clovis culture, with its distinctive fluted projectile points. But even 50 years ago, some scholars argued that people had migrated into the New World much earlier than 12,000 years ago. And from 1988 onward, increasing amounts of evidence from Monte Verde, a site way down in Chile, began to suggest that people had been in South America more than 20,000 years ago. By 2000, there was increasing evidence for a pre-Clovis culture. And since then, discovery of human footprints at White Sands, New Mexico, that can be confidently dated to more than 21,000 years ago, seem to clinch the matter. And some archaeologists would argue that the reason we found it so difficult to find terrestrial evidence for this earlier migration into the Americas is that the earliest migrants were probably boat-using maritime peoples, who may first have traveled down the North American coast in pursuit of sea mammals. If so, most of the earliest sites were probably engulfed by rising sea levels in the Holocene. But the more general point is that when new evidence challenges archaeological orthodoxies, it initially encounters some resistance, but as more and more evidence accumulates, archaeologists eventually accept the new theories. Whatever else you might say about ivory towers, they don't reward archaeologists who stick stubbornly to theories that have been undermined by new evidence. And there's certainly no reward for burying exciting new evidence that challenges those orthodoxies. So who's really benefiting here? The fact is that people promulgate these sensational stories because they are very profitable. For example, one television channel that purports to offer programming on historical topics actually makes much of its revenue from pseudo-history and conspiracy theories. Of its 21 top-rated shows in 2021, seven were of this sensationalist nature, including one on ancient aliens and three on UFOs. You'd have to look pretty hard to find documentaries on legitimate history and archaeological topics. And while it's not exactly Fortune 500 material, it does make significant amounts of money, with 100 million viewers and revenue of $11 million, as well as YouTube income. Recently, a major streaming service began airing a series based on Hancock's views on an ancient pre-Neolithic civilization. 
Presumably, this has been very profitable for both Graham Hancock and the channel. With 25 million viewing hours in the first week, leading to a rank in the top 10. Eric Von Daniken did very well for himself. Chariots of the Gods and the books that followed sold millions of copies, so that he now has a net worth estimated at $30 million. More recent authors have had less time than Von Daniken to accumulate wealth, but as an example, Graham Hancock's Fingerprints of the Gods has sold an estimated 5 million copies, and his more recent books another 2 million copies. It doesn't take much imagination to estimate the minimal royalties that would result from such sales. In addition, Hancock gets 30 to 40 pounds per person whenever he gives a public lecture. That's roughly 35 to 50 US dollars. Lest this sound like sour grapes, these authors are to be congratulated for writing books so entertaining that they attract a wide audience. If archaeologists' books don't sell anywhere near as many copies, Arguably, that's our own fault for not making our work more appealing to the general public. However, one could wish that authors like Collins and Hancock were more honest in their presentation of the so-called facts, and it's pretty obvious what their motivations are. Once these sensational stories make their way into websites, YouTube videos, and social media, they become clickbait that spreads through social networks like wildfire. The more sensational the headline or thumbnail, the more likely it will attract clicks and be passed on. Well, thank you for making it to the end of this video. I'm not sure if I've convinced you that any of these claims are false, but I hope that in future, at the very least, you look at some of these theories with a more critical eye. Are the authors actually presenting evidence for their claims, or are they making arguments from silence or just providing their personal opinion about things? Um, and you know, do, do these things actually make common sense? Sometimes they don't, I, in my opinion. Um, just in case you want to read more about this, I put quite a bit of references at the end to the actual authors of some of these pieces, but I'll also make some links down below to some sites that also uh, debunk some of the specific theories so that you can see some, somebody else's opinion about um, how these arguments work or whether they work at all. Thank you and stay safe.